Mathematics, numbers, and numerical relationships pervade our universe. Some scientists say that if a spaceship should explore looking for other intelligent life, it should include classic mathematical formulas like circumference equals 2 pi r because these would be universally recognized and an indication of the intelligence of those who sent the ship. As much as many folks dislike studying math, it is part of life because it is part of God and God created life. Math is not the product of a human mind. Man did not invent math. He found it embedded in the very foundation of all creation. Mathematical rules and laws remain constant because God has always existed and he likewise remains constant. We find many interesting correlations between specific concepts and numbers in the Bible. We see that seven often refers to a kind of perfection or completion. Four indicates that all the possibilities are included. Eight means new beginnings. Many books have been written covering this topic, not the least of which is E.W. Bullinger's Numbers in Scripture. Today we're going to look at the number 12, the even dozen. There is such a thing as a baker's dozen, sometimes called the devil's dozen, when you actually receive 13 of whatever you ordered. The history of this goes back to a time when bread was sold by weight rather than by the unit, for example, a loaf. The 13th unit was given to be sure that the complete and proper weight had been given. Since we have 10 fingers and 10 toes, we are quite used to using a decimal system based on cycles of 10 numbers but there is also a duodecimal system, which is not to be confused with the Dewey Decimal System, which is one of the systems used for categorizing library books. The duodecimal system reckons things in cycles of 12, for example, the number of moon cycles in a year. The system is quite old and goes back to Babylonian times, even the second or third millennium BCE, and is the system that the Babylonians based their time sequencing on. From there, we get the 60-second minute, as 60 is 12 times 5, the 60-minute hour, the 24-hour day, and the 360-degree circle. A person can also use their fingers to effectively count in this system. Each finger consists of three small bones, and you can use the thumb to keep track of 12 items. The fingers of the opposite hand can keep track of the iterations of 12 up to five times by the finger, giving cycles of 60, or by the bones of the opposite hand, you can count up to a total of a gross number of items, that is 144. We also find 12 constellations on the ecliptic. 12 inches and a foot and 12 pence and a shilling indicate that the ancient Britons also used the base 12 system for some things. What can we say about the groups of 12 in the Bible? Of course, there are 12 sons of Jacob, founders of the 12 tribes of Israel and forefathers of the nation. They are represented many times over by the loaves of showbread in the tabernacle, by the stars in the crown of the woman in Revelation, by the stones on the breastplate of the high priest. And then there are 12 apostles. Their tribes are unnamed, but clearly not all the tribes are represented since there are at least two pairs of brothers. There are also 12 minor prophets. What can we suggest that these significant groups point to? Perhaps something on the order of government, or maybe something to do with representation for the government. There is one interesting narrative which contains two seemingly unrelated events during Yeshua's ministry involving a time span of 12 years. The story appears in the three synoptic gospels and begins in Mark at chapter 5, verse 22. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogues, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, that is Yeshua, he fell at his feet. He besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Yeshua went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. Thus the story begins, but there is an interruption. Continuing in Mark 5, verse 25. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse, 
when she had heard of Yeshua, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Perhaps you have heard that she was reaching for his tzitzit, the fringes at the corners of his garment. Continuing in verse 30. And Yeshua, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and thou sayest, Who touched me? And he looked round to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him, and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace, and be whole of thy plague. It's quite interesting that in the Babylonian Talmud, in Tractate Shabbat 110a and 110b, are given remedies for this ailment, which is called Zava in Hebrew, and which is defined in Leviticus 15, 25-29. Some of these remedies are simply tonics to improve the health, and some are absurdly superstitious. For example, burning an ostrich egg and putting the ashes in a linen cloth in the summer or a cotton cloth in the winter. After each remedy is administered, these words are spoken to the afflicted woman, Arise from your discharge. Although this is often translated as stop or cease from your discharge, the Aramaic word used is kum, that is, arise. Now the interruption is over. Mark 5.35 While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead, why troublest thou the master any further? As soon as Yeshua heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and seeth the tumult, and them that wept, and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, Why make ye this ado, and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. It appears that during the interruption the young girl has died. The traditional mourners are in full swing. However, even as Yeshua Paul came to the disciples that Lazarus was sleeping, the same meaning is true here. Continuing in verse 40. And they laughed him to scorn. And when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel, and them that were with him, and entereth in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha kumi, which is, being interpreted, Damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of twelve years. And they were astonished with great astonishment. Mark's version is the only one where the actual Aramaic words of Yeshua are preserved and transliterated into the Greek alphabet. Talitha kumi, arise, young lady. It is the same instruction which might have been given to the healed woman with the issue of blood. Arise from your discharge. And now we see that the young lady is twelve years old. Would it be a coincidence that the two time periods, the length of the older woman's affliction and the length of the young woman's life, are equal? Alfred Edersheim, a great Jewish scholar and believer in Yeshua in the late 19th century in Europe, wrote a book called The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, a 1,000-plus page tome covering every Jewish cultural and written reverence to the context of Yeshua's life and actions. Edersheim has written of these two events. This coincidence is, indeed, so trivial as not to deserve serious notice, since there can be no conceivable connection between the age of the child and the duration of the woman's disease, nor indeed between the two cases except this, that both appealed to Jesus. Really? I beg to differ. Nothing in the Bible is either by coincidence or trivial. Would you agree? On Edersham's behalf, please remember that he lived in a very different generation and was not privileged to see such hidden prophecies coming to pass as we are able to see. 
If we were to discuss the prodigal son, I imagine that many of you would say that the older son was the Jew, staying faithfully at his father's side, keeping the Torah, and taking offense when the younger son, the later addition to the family, arrives home and wants to be restored. Perhaps here we have a similar situation. The afflicted woman has been in ill health for as long as the young girl has been alive. Yeshua is on the way to restore the young girl when he is interrupted by the afflicted woman, who is healed by his touch. What can we infer? If the afflicted woman is Israel, founded by the twelve tribes, pictured as the woman with the twelve stars in her crown, represented here bleeding life, unable to participate in proper temple fellowship, through exile, through loss of identity, through persecution, through rejection of the Messiah, then who is the young woman? born at the same time as the beginning of the other's affliction, perhaps prospering for a time, but now suddenly lying at death's door, also needing to be raised from the dead, but only after the older woman is healed. Listen to this quote from A.R. Fawcett, late 19th century clergyman, commenting on Zechariah 4.2, speaking of the golden menorah. The Gentile churches will not realize their unity until the Jewish church as the stem unites all the lamps in one candlestick. The two women's stories are tied together as the destinies of the two groups are inexorably bound one to another. As it is written in Ezekiel 37, beginning in verse 15, The word of Jehovah came again to me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it, for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel and his companions, and join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thy hand. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these? Say unto them, Thus says the Lord Jehovah, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel his fellows, and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and will make them one stick, and they shall be one in my hand. And the sticks whereon thou ridest shall be in thine hand before their eyes. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord Jehovah, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land, and I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all. And they shall no more be two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned, and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people." and I will be their God.